Welcome to CivilNet. Our guest today in the studio is Dr. Lawrence Brewers of Conciliation Resources. Uh, Dr. Brewers, thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Yeah. Glad to have you here. You are one of the few scholars, academics, I know you don't like the word experts, uh, in the Caucasus, who uh, has, you've stuck with the Caucasus since 1997. You know, there will be people who get interested in, then, in the field and uh, perhaps uh, uh, a number of years later, their interests shift. Um, you have been in the region uh, recently holding uh, meetings uh, in NKR and nagorno karabakh Baku, and you've been now in Yerevan for a number of weeks. That's right. Uh, tell us what you uh, are working on at this particular time. Well, I've been in the region uh, for the past uh, few weeks, uh, together with Conciliation Resources, uh, participating in a number of meetings uh, on the Madrid Principles. Um, we've had meetings in Baku, in Stepanakert, uh, and in Yerevan, uh, eliciting opinions on where do we go uh, with the Madrid Principles, is there still life uh, in this peace proposal? Uh, I've been in the wider region uh, for nearly a year now, uh, conducting research uh, for a research project uh, on the Karabakh conflict, um, where we are today relative to uh, 20 years ago, the ways in which the conflict has deepened, has widened, has come to affect an ever wider uh, number of policy spheres and is really affecting uh, the trajectories uh, of Armenia uh, and Azerbaijan. And fin <coughs> finally, I've also been promoting uh, a new journal, Caucasus Survey, uh, this is the uh, first scholarly journal that's dedicated exclusively to the Caucasus, North and South, and aims to plug a gap uh, in the market uh, of scholarly journals. We have a journal of Baltic studies, we have Balkan studies, we have Central Asia survey, and any number of Slavic reviews, but not a journal dedicated to the Caucasus. So um, I'd also like to encourage scholars uh, in the region to submit their research articles to and us. And to use it for, uh, for a number of reasons. You're the editor of this uh, of this publication, um, you know, you said something uh, in 1994 when the ceasefire was uh, signed, um, and now today, uh, more than 20 years later, it seems that Armenians and Azerbaijan are further apart than they were back then. There is a whole generation of Armenians and Azerbaijanis who have not lived side by side, who probably have never even seen an Azerbaijani from the region. Um, and in light of recent events, if we can call them recent, this past year has seen an escalation of violence on the line of contact and on the state border between Armenia and Azerbaijan. The rhetoric has increased. The bellicose statements of you know, threatening war uh, by uh, Aliyev have increased. Uh, there's a deepening distrust. Um, a lot of people thinking that the OSC Minsk group has become ineffective. Uh, Armenia wanting the process to continue, Azerbaijan continually looking for other international platforms. Um, very grand and sort of wide question, but what are the prospects for peace? Well, as you've identified, it's probably the lowest moment uh, in this process uh, since 1994. I think probably the sides uh, were at their closest uh, in the early negotiations in 1997. Um, when the package and step-by-step -step solutions were, were tackled. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around Key West, whether that was really uh, a near miss uh, or not. Um, but since then, you're absolutely right, there's been a process of uh, mutual alienation um, happening alongside new realities. Um, there is a, a new reality, for example, in Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, there are new institutions, there is a new cartography, there is a new mythology uh, that has you know, uh, taken root in that territory and it's a, a reality that not m many people get to see. Um, there are the changing realities of the wider region. Uh, Self-determination conflicts have been resolved in different ways, uh, so the parties can take the lessons that they want. Um, and then there has been, I think, a change in the balance of, of power between the parties. Uh, there's a lot of uh, rhetoric uh, about that, um, but I think uh, Azerbaijan today is very far from being the shattered, fragmented country that it was in the mid-90s, and has very few incentives to agree to the compromises that it might have contemplated uh, a few years ago. So these are all factors that are embedding uh, this conflict in, in different ways. Um, and what about levels of development and democracy? How important are they in this equation? Well, 
one of the themes of my research is actually the securitization uh, of domestic politics and how this unresolved conflict and uh, line of contact uh, violations, a constant stream of bad news from the front, casualties uh, and so on, has a, a silencing effect uh, on opposition of any kind. Um, and uh, we've seen, particularly in Azerbaijan, uh, over the last uh, year, uh, a securitization of dialogue. Um, many of the partners that we used to work with in civil society are now behind bars, um, which makes it uh, a very, very difficult situation, very few prospects um, uh, for peace uh, in that context. And what really concerns me is that there are increasingly few interlocutors in Azerbaijani society that can be seen as counterparts uh, by civil society here uh, in Armenia. Um, and I hope that uh, the Azerbaijani state will rethink this strategy and try to look for allies in society, in its own society, um, uh, for, uh, its, uh, uh, in its quest uh, to, to resolve the conflict. And I think overall this is a consistent message. Uh, in 2005 I edited a, a publication for Conciliation Resources called The Limits of Leadership and how leaders on their own are not able uh, to uh, deliver a functional peace process. And I think that message still very much stands. And certainly we've had discussions with uh, other um, scholars and uh, people who are involved in the process. And, and because the, the, the negotiations have been on the level of, of, of presidents and they haven't really filtered down uh, to the level of foreign ministers and then through perhaps, you know, cross uh, initiatives, uh, whereas uh, Armenia and its relationships with, relationship with Turkey, even though with closed borders and no diplomatic relations, you still see a, a greater traffic, if I may use that word, of civil society initiatives. Uh, with Azerbaijan, it's almost impossible uh, for us to find civil society partners or partners in media with whom we could work to uh, perhaps ease the tension. Um, but w the negotiation process, if it moved beyond the level of the presidencies, of the respective presidencies, would that contribute in any way? Or is, are we not there yet? Well, I think there is, a, in the comparison with Turkey, I mean, there is obviously uh, a very different time scale uh, involved. Sure. Uh, there is a completely different feeling as to how resolved and how, how long the status quo can go on. Right. Um, uh, there is a, a kind of a, a status quo in the Armenian-Turkish uh, uh, situation that is, that is accepted, um, more or less. Uh, in Azerbaijan, that's, that's not the case. Um, with regard to uh, cross-conflict contacts, um, yes, the, the process has been very much monopolized by presidents uh, and foreign ministers. I think at the track one level, um, we can think about changing uh, that dynamic. Could there not be uh, alternative tracks of dialogue between, for example, uh, presidential envoys uh, on the conflict or the ministries of defense who did used to have contacts uh, and, and in the past don't. and now don't? Um, and I think with regard to civil society, it's very easy to forget that there was actually a very broad range of different kinds of activity going on. Um, and one of the key things that I think is really missing today uh, is reciprocal visits uh, across the conflict, um, which have been securitized and uh, are no longer possible. I think we really need to bring that, that you use the word traffic, I think that's exactly what we need. Uh, we need a situation where a thousand flowers bloom. Um, uh, relationships uh, need to be uh, transformed and uh, dialogue needs to be opened. And we see the benefits of that in the Armenian-Turkish context where the politics remains locked, locked down, but at the level of Turkish society, I think there is uh, a lot of, there are a lot of positive developments. Mm -hmm. Speaking of Turkish society and, and Armenia-Turkey, it is the centenary year of the Armenian Genocide, a much anticipated year, I think, uh, for Armenians, not only in Armenia, uh, but also in the diaspora, certainly. Um, and I think that we are realistic uh, and we do understand that, you know, because it's the 100th year, it, it is simply a number and life will continue on April 25 and in 2016 and, and going and moving forward. Um, are the two related in your opinion? I mean, if Armenia and Turkey by some um, miraculous stroke of, you know, or, or uh, a magic wand were to come and Armenia, Turkey uh, would come to some kind of resolution, whatever that resolution is, and, and the border, uh, Turkey would lift its, uh, you know, the closing of, which it closed in, in solidarity with Azerbaijan during the height of the war. Would that then contribute to any kind of easing intentions or perhaps a road to peace with Azerbaijan? 
Well, I, I think it would. Uh, it would really change the situation uh, in a context where there hasn't really been any change on the ground mm -hmm. uh, in, in more than 20 years. Um, the normalization of Armenian-Turkish uh, relations really invites us to think outside of the box and really game-changing moments. I mean, just imagine that there would be a Turkish embassy uh, here in Yerevan. Uh, that would be a, a, a natural kind of go-between um, between, between uh, Armenians and Azerbaijanis. Um, uh, and I think that it would reduce the feeling of uh, isolation here. Uh, it would uh, uh, make immeasurable progress in, in shattering certain stereotypes. Um, so I would... Uh, For Azerbaijan as well? Uh, yeah. I think for Azerbaijan as well. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, the Turkish-Azerbaijani relationship, I think, is often assumed and, and taken as a given. But it's not always so black and white, is it? Right, and I think that was one of the lessons of, of the protocols, um, is you know, how, does, how does each party manage that relationship in ways that uh, separates ideology from rationality. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I think it would uh, be a game-changing moment if it, if it happened. Um, and I think the way to achieve change is ultimately uh, long-term patient work uh, with Turkish society. And if the Armenian goal is Turkish recognition, that would come when Turkish society demands it. And is it, uh, you know, perhaps you, you, you're not the right person to ask this question, but, I, but I'm going to ask it. Uh, you know, oftentimes uh, Armenians, uh, some Armenians say that it is our responsibility to contribute to the enlightenment, if I can use that word, of Turkish society about its past. And there are other Armenians who say, well, that's not my job. I mean, I was the victim, they were the perpetrators, and they should uh, take on the responsibility. But <clears throat> There has been a big shift in Turkey. I mean, in the last 10 years alone, 10 years ago, you couldn't use the word genocide in Turkey. Uh, and I think much changed after the assassination. Well, I don't like to say that. The life and then assassination of Harant Dink because it was because of what he did in his lifetime. I think that uh, prepared the groundwork and then his assassination shifted a lot of things in Turkish society. And now they are openly uh, talking about these events. Um, but how, you know, as, as somebody who's been, uh, you know, following the region, um, if Turkish society was ready today, with the Turkish government of today, listen to them. Well, I think, first of all, Turkish society is not necessarily ready today. Sure. Uh, so we, we need to assume uh, a different kind of state society relationship in Turkey. Uh, from all indications, uh, the, the Turkish government of today is not anywhere near uh, ready uh, for that kind of politics. And I think um, it's a very gradual, incremental process. Uh, Hrant Dink's great achievement was to open up a public space. Um, I'd like to highlight the work of uh, some great NGOs like Anadolu Kultur, um, who have done very valuable work. Um, uh, filmmakers, Mehmet Binay, uh, participated in a project that I was involved in, a film called Memories Without Borders, mm -hmm. uh, which was a little bit before its time. And I think there were some very important messages uh, in Mehmet's segment of the film aimed at uh, Armenian audiences, that uh, there is uh, a demand. It might still be a very much a minority demand and limited to a certain circle, a certain milieu in Turkey, that uh, wants Turkey to uh, address and acknowledge uh, its Armenian heritage. Uh, so, um, you know, I think there are positive steps and my guess is that we have to wait uh, a long time before such steps will come in the Armenian-Azerbaijani context, but they will eventually happen. Sure, we hope so. Dr. Be Brewers, thank you so much uh, thank you. for coming and for being our guest and uh, for being, uh, you know, among the few people in the world who, who take a, a real scholarly interest uh, in the region. Uh, it is a region where people live. Quite so, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. I'd like to remind our viewers that my guest was Dr. Lawrence Brewers of Conciliation Resources. Stay with CivilNet.